I'm Dan Slater, uh, president of Alliance Francaise de Pasadena. Glad you could join us uh, this evening. We have a wonderful guest, Robin Oslison, who um, has among her background, uh, having earned multiple degrees up to the PhD in art history from Yale University. And um, she worked uh, at the Huntington uh, Library here in uh, our area for about 10 years. And uh, while well, she was working on a, a catalog of uh, British uh, uh, paintings, and uh, so uh, that uh, was published by the Huntington. And uh, now she is at the National Portrait Gallery of the Smithsonian uh, Institution, and in where she's the curator of prints and drawings. And uh, with that background, uh, she is the curator of an exhibition that uh, runs through February 25th, 23rd, 23rd, in Washington at the National Portrait Gallery, Brilliant Exiles, American Women in Paris, 1900 to 1939. And since uh, uh, most of us are not going to get back to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, before then. It's so wonderful to have her with us here uh, by Zoom. So we can learn about this exhibition and uh, uh, how it came together and what's involved with it and the fascinating women who are profiled uh, in the exhibition. Uh, so, uh, Robin Oslison, welcome to Alliance Francaise de Pasadena. We're so glad you could be with us. Well, I'm thrilled to be with you. I wish I could literally be with you, but it's it's great we can be together on Zoom anyway. So I'm going to jump right in and um, share my screen and just you'll have to tell me if you can start to see something here. We had a little hiccup before. Let's see. Are you there we can now? see. Okay, awesome. I'm going to... Get rid of some of the things. Okay, so I'm so excited to talk about this. Um, this has been a labor of love for about five years for me. Um, I didn't really know a lot about all these women that I've been working on um, through these years until I started the research, and it was such a revelation. I think many of you, like myself, will be familiar with the so-called lost generation of American modernists who led this bohemian existence in Paris during the 1920s. There's been a slew of uh, literary biographies about them um, and their nostalgic memoirs. They're really focused on this group of hard drinking, fast living, disillusioned, white, heterosexual male writers and artists, men like Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, were drawn to Paris by the favorable exchange rate um, during the 20s and also the lack of prohibition laws. And they spent their time hanging out in cafes being geniuses together as Robert McAlman put it. And that, so that narrative has really pri prioritized men, uh, their experiences in Paris. Um, and with the exception of a few token figures, the perspectives and achievements of women have been minimized or excluded from that history. So I wanted to see what happens when we reconsider this history of Americans in Paris exclusively from the perspective of women rather than men. Not surprisingly, um, a very different picture emerges. Um, and it's a picture so different um, that it really deserves to be better known. So the women that are featured in this exhibition, they went to Paris not as a lark, but as a necessity. They saw it transformative experiences that were unavailable to them in the United States. And they really shifted the cultural landscape while they were there, many of them, and anticipated many of the issues around gender and sexuality and race that preoccupy us today. Um, and it also, this history begins much earlier than the 1920s. It starts really at the turn of the 20th century, 1900, the dawn of a new century. And it continues right up until the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. And then also the cultural innovations that these women pursued in Paris went well beyond literature and art, it included dance, music, design, fashion, theater, entrepreneurship, and, and more. And so as I researched this exhibition, the words of these women made it clear to me that they did not consider themselves a lost generation. 
in, in Paris, they really found themselves. And I just have a few images of these women here. Um, the photographer Berenice Abbott literally said, by going to France, I found myself and my own country. I just sort of thank God for France, vive la France. And the painter Lois Maylou Jones, an African-American woman said, it was in France that I first experienced the freedom to work without any hindrance because of my race or color. Uh, the writer Catherine M. Porter, Europe was the place for me, Paris the city, France the country. From there, I got a perspective and somehow without a struggle, my point of view fell into clear focus. And then the famous Salonist uh, and, and writer, Natalie Barney said, Paris has always seemed to me the only city in which one can express oneself as one pleases. And then she went on in that same quotation to say, in France, thought, food, and love have remained a matter of personal taste and one's own business. So what was special for these women was that as foreigners in an unusually tolerant cosmopolitan city, uh, they were free from both the restrictions placed on women in the United States and those placed on French women in Paris. They, they were under the radar and many of them used this unprecedented experience of freedom and autonomy to reinvent themselves. And what I'm really arguing in this exhibition is that portraits provided uh, productive opportunities for them to explore and visually define these new ideas about what it was to be a woman in this modern era. So Isadora Duncan kind of led the way. She arrived in Paris in 1900 to dance the freedom of women, as she put it. In place of the regimented steps of ballet and also the bodily restrictions created by point shoes and corsets and tutus and so on, she pursued self-expressive movement and danced barefoot, wearing minimal clothing, as you see here. She, she really wanted to free her body and, and the bodies of other women from artificial constraints of all kinds. Her quest um, to liberate women's bodies went beyond dance and it included a commitment to sexual and reproductive freedom at a time when those ideas were far from the norm. Uh, and her radical approach to dance really laid the groundwork for what we now call modern dance, this international modern dance movement. But she also inspired visual artists. The way she rejected tradition throughout the rules was really uh, pathbreaking for visual artists who wanted to do the same thing with their art. And many of them also were fascinated with the way she moved and were, tried to capture an impression of her body in motion through their art. And I'm just showing you here um, a couple of watercolors by Abraham Wachowitz, who is another American in Paris. These are just two of over 5,000 drawings that he made of Duncan. He just obsessively um, sort of re-experienced her dance almost through muscle memory of his moving hand, just remembering what it was like to see her, her dance. And I, I wish I could just show you, you know, 20 of these in a row. It'd be like a stop action movie sort of um, uh, that gives us a sense of what it was like to see her moving. And then another artist, Edward Steich, and this, these are all um, portraits and paintings that are in the exhibition. He adopted a different approach to representing what it was like to see Isadora Duncan dance. He's representing her here at his garden at Boulanger outside of Paris. Uh, it's a place where he had, he cultivated flowers in this lovely garden. And he's showing this tiny figure of Duncan. You can just see sort of at lower right, dancing uh, naked in the garden with a, um, drapery that she's swinging around. And then at the lower left, you can see the shadowy forms of spectators watching her. And there's a, this giant tree and dramatic clouds. So rather than focus on her, we're seeing or feeling what she felt in nature that really inspired her dance. Um, now, other women use performance, chiefly dance, to express their own cultural countercultural ideas about women's bodily autonomy. Several of them pursued imaginative reinterpretations of non-Western movement traditions, um, sort of so-called Eastern dance, which provided an excuse to shed, again, the tightly corseted fashions of their day and to break free also from the tightly regulated social constraints on their behavior. Believe it or not, the woman I'm showing you here is Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney best known as a monumental sculptor, but also as the art patron who founded the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York City. But she was also a very highly regarded amateur dancer. Uh, and she, she was known up and down the East Coast for 
the beauty of her dance performances. In Paris, she became really devoted to Sergei Diaghilev's avant-garde Russian dance company, the Ballet Russe. Um, it was known for these very immersive experience, experiences of Orientalist fantasies, especially with color and light, costumes and music, all creating this kind of heady ambiance. And so she, when she returned to her studio in New York, commissioned, um, well, before she went back to New York, she commissioned the designer for the Ballet Russe, Leon Bax, to design for her a costume that was based on those kind of Orientalist designs that uh, were featured in the ballet. And here you see her wearing one. And she would put on this costume whenever the drop of a hat almost whenever she's having a dinner party or some kind of social gathering, she would put on this costume and perform one of these Eastern so-called dances, something from India or China, Persia. And you can see how this bell-shaped tunic she's wearing and the Turkish trousers freed her hips and legs to move in a way that um, women didn't usually move in her social class. So it was a kind of liberating outfit. Today, we would say this is all cultural appropriation, but I think at the time it served an important purpose in allowing women to explore their sensuality in ways that um, they really couldn't without the artistic license that dance provided them with. And this painting I'm showing you is monumental. It's 104 inches high. So is that almost 10 feet tall? And it's part of a whole series of paintings by her childhood friend, Howard Gardner Cushing, who decorated her Long Island studio with paintings in this vein that kind of recreate the atmosphere of a ballet russe production in a way. But this is the only one that shows her. Um, and she was also drawn by John Singer Sargent in this costume. She was photographed for Vogue wearing it. She'd absolutely loved uh, the way she felt in this costume. Now, other American women rejected the traditional paths laid out for them in the United States, and they sought liberated, independent lives as professional artists within the male-dominated modern art milieu that they found in early 20th century Paris. And again, these three spectacular paintings are part are enormous, um, 120 inches tall, 210 inches wide. Um, they're on loan from the collection at Art Bridges. And they were painted by Edward Steichen. I showed you a portrait or a painting of his garden with Isidore Duncan a few minutes ago. Um, and this is a very different style from what he usually painted in. The women represented are at left, um, Catherine Nash Rhodes, a painter. And then to her right, uh, the woman with a purple uh, cloak is Marion Beckett, also a painter. And then at the far right is um, Mercedes de Cordoba, who was multifaceted, an illustrator, actor, as a soprano, um, very talented woman. So um, we don't know who the woman in the transparent drapery is standing up um, in between Rhodes and Beckett. Maybe Isadora Duncan, not really sure. Um, that's something art historians continue to debate. But um, the other three women are all talented, artistic. They went to Paris in the early 19th century, uh, 1900s, to pursue artistic experimentation as a way of rebelling against convention, both in their personal lives and in their professional practice. And they wore their individuality and creativity literally on their sleeves. Uh, they developed a very distinctive way of dressing in these flowing corset-free gowns with exotic headgear and long dangling earrings, all these things they wore to declare, we are bohemian, we are artists, we are creative. Uh, we are a different type of woman than you're accustomed to. So at the same time, Steichen's paintings really speak to the attitudes women like these were up against when trying to gain traction in the male dominated modern art world. Uh, the imagery was inspired by Steichen's beautiful garden that I just described earlier. And these women often spent time there together. They were a friend group and there were men there as well. Um, and Steichen included stylized representations of the flowers from his garden in this painting. And he identified each woman with a specific floral alter ego. So um, as he called the painting in exaltation of flowers, it's not clear if he's referring to the actual flowers or to the women as personifications of flowers. Um, but we know that Nash was identified with geranium and 
Beckett with petunia and so on. And it was a kind of a language of flowers. They thought that these flowers had some kind of attribute that they identified with. Um, but the, the real issue here is that the male artists uh, in this circle tended to see the women as decorative objects. They were models, they were muses, and they were potential sexual partners, uh, personified flowers, rather than as artists in their own right. Um, there are accounts of people going to see art exhibits and saying, oh, don't even look at the art on the walls. Look at these beautiful women, Catherine Nash Rhodes and Marion Beckett. And I think the splendor of these murals with their jewel-like colors and gold leaf. I hope you can make out that the top and the bottom, that is actually, those are squares of gold leaf. It's just a stunning uh, mural series. Uh, series. Um, this kind of almost over the top style suggests to me that Steichen was dazzled by these unconventional women and really trying to capture through this unusual style he's adopting here, something of their stunning presence. Um, something he got away from the kind of misty tonalist style we saw in the other painting to represent them in a way that um, lived up to their incredible persona in, in public. Now, Catherine Nash Rhodes on the left uh, would go on to establish the Freer Art Gallery, which is now the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, along with her friend, Agnes Ernst Meyer, who I'm showing you on the right. And it was actually Meyer and her husband, Eugene, who commissioned Sykin's murals as decorations for their Manhattan townhouse. And uh, the Meyers, both the couple would later purchase the Washington Post. And it was their daughter, Catherine Graham, who you've probably heard of as the publisher of the Post during the Watergate crisis and all of that. And she was named for Catherine Nash Rhodes. So these women are all interconnected with each other and have a legacy that continues pretty much into our own day. Agnes Meyer, um, incidentally, she, her interest in journalism began as a young woman. In 1908, when she just graduated from college, she defied her parents' traditional expectations by deciding she was going to cross the Atlantic and explore the modern art scene in Paris as a journalist working for the New York Sun. She did that without a chaperone, which was quite unusual for the time. And she mingled with ultra-modern painters at Gertrude Stein's salon. She received uh, tutoring from the world-renowned sculptor Auguste Rodin, uh, but at the cost of fighting off his relentless sexual advances. Um, and similarly, Catherine Nash Rhodes was pressured by her portraitist, Alfred Stieglitz, who was a married man more than 20 years her senior, um, made that photograph you see there. Uh, he was also pressuring her into a relationship. So one of the things I found when reading these women's letters and diaries was that they were struggling with many of the same issues that uh, we were talking about. This was 2019 when I started working on this and it was the height of the Me Too era, um, that they were fending off these unwanted advances while trying to also gain the assistance of powerful men in their fields. So it felt like a very contemporary kind of situation. Another American woman artist who navigated uh, dif with difficulty her position with this, within this male dominated modern art world was Anne Estelle Rice. Uh, she also arrived in Paris very early in the 1900s in 1904. And she soon established herself as a key figure in a circle of Anglo-American artists who were incorporating a rhythmic component into the, uh, the bold colors and rough brushwork of Fauve painting. That's the style that Henri Matisse and André Doran and others introduced to Paris in 1905. By 1911, progressive critics were referring to Rice as a leader of the Fauvist movement and a leader of the modernists in Paris. And in 1912, a critic singled her out as the one strong woman painter in Paris, which I love is kind of praising faintly. Um, but despite her importance as an artist, um, her closest male colleague, who was the British painter, John Duncan Ferguson, often treated her as a model or a muse, obsessively painting her as a kind of decorative object, you know, with accessories of flowers and fashionable hats and clothing, rather than as a professional colleague with artistic agency of her own. And she responded in a really clever way with this self-portrait you're seeing on the right. I think she's directly looking at the painting by John Duncan Ferguson on the left, and she's um, 
kind of commenting on the way he's objectified her over and over again in these paintings. And you can see the way she's painted herself. She's not a figure in a painting. She's actually a painting in a still life composition. So you can see the frame around her image. Um, so she's kind of, I think, making a sardonic comment about the way she's been so often objectified that she almost feels like a painting. Now for African-American women, living in Paris was a doubly liberating experience. It provided a respite from the toxic racism of the United States, as well as the limitations that sexism placed on their professional lives and their personal liberties at home. So I don't wanna suggest that Parisian society was colorblind or lacking in sexist attitudes, it absolutely was not. But in Paris, American women of color were free to study at city's many art academies and private studios, to show their work in prestigious exhibitions, and to be able to go to any restaurant or hotel without fear of being turned away because of segregation, which, um, you know, there wasn't that kind of policy in, in Paris or in France or in Europe, anywhere but the United States. Now, the artist I'm showing you here, uh, Lois Maylou Jones, wrote um, with great passion about the experience of going to France and how much it meant to her. Uh, her papers are at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where she taught for many years. And I was uh, going through her papers, really opened my eyes to what it must have been like for these African-American women to go to a place where they suddenly had the freedom to be fully human and, and to be treated like anybody else. She wrote um, that she was forced to go abroad to achieve the recognition my own society was not willing to give. There I was treated with great respect. And so while I was going through her papers, I was really struck by a number of snapshots, personal snapshots such as these, that she kept uh, for all those years that showed her painting in public spaces in Paris with white spectators looking on with respect and admiration. And I think these public encounters were probably would have been hard to imagine in the United States at the time, but um, these images really validated and reinforced for her the sense that she was an artist and, and that she could have a career, that there was a place where she would be given opportunity and her work would be respected. So the self-portrait that I showed you before that she painted shortly after returning to the United States really reflects the new confidence she gained in Paris. Uh, it really asserts her identity as a painter. She's dressed in an artist's smock. She's standing before an easel. She has paintbrushes in her hand, all of that. But she's showing herself as a, a Parisian trained artist. The pendant she's wearing at her neck, when you get right up on it, you can see it says Paris. And then the African figurines in the background are examples of the kind of African art that was on display everywhere, she said, museums and galleries and uh, international expositions. And she said she sketched everything. This is her first real encounter with actual African artifacts. And I believe that she purchased those two figurines because very similar figures show up in photographs of her apartment. So there are these references to the impact that Paris had on her art. It was in Paris, for example, that um, this is her Paris studio on the left, that she painted um, fetiche, the semi-abstract uh, rendering of African masks that you see on the right. And she had been up until then painting in an impressionist style in Paris. And when she painted a uh, fetiche, her um, instructors or professors kind of raised their eyebrows and she was indignant and said, you know, Picasso and other European modernists are drawing inspiration from African art. And with my heritage, I have an even greater right to do so. And so this ex um, exposure to African art, African people in Paris really had an impact on her career and started to alter the way she uh, painted. Other artists of color, such as Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, um, also deepened their connection to African culture during their time in Paris. Uh, Prophet, for example, although she took great pride in her Indian heritage, she was Narragansett and Pequot, uh, Narragansett and Pequot ancestry. Uh, in Paris, she became intrigued by artifacts and people connected with her African heritage. Uh, an example is of her sculpture on the right called Congolais. Um, it's uh, it's interesting because not only does it speak to the impact of 
seeing African people and seeing African art on her work, but it also shows how closely interconnected American women were in Paris. That sculpture on the right was purchased by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney for the Whitney Museum of Art. It's one of the first acquisitions she made. She just founded the museum the previous year. So Prophet kept a diary in, uh, of her time in Paris. At the 12 years she lived there in extreme poverty. Uh, she arrived in August 1922 and devoted herself to physically demanding stone and wood carving. The whole time she was there, she was living and working in shabby, unheated studios, often without food or human contact for weeks. Um, but at the same time, she presented herself with a kind of artistic flair. You can see a bit in these two photographs. Um, on the left, she's wearing a kind of bohemian outfit, batik top with these pearls, or um, not pearls, but beaded, a double beaded necklace. And then on the right, this very strange kind of oversized pilgrim hat with a crisscross collar. And there are descriptions of her, like um, the poet County Cullen remembered her sweeping into a Paris studio in a flowing black cape and a broad black hat and just impressing everyone with her elan despite the fact that she was barely surviving at the time. Um, by 1934, she had exhausted her resources. She had um, run out of money. She'd applied for every kind of scholarship and just was forced to return to the United States. And she went on to teach at Spelman uh, College in Atlanta, where she made a huge impact um, coming in with her Parisian uh, background in these incredible outfits she wore and her women students were especially impressed with her and one of them Geneva Higgins McGee made the um, bas relief you see on the right a portrait of Nancy Elizabeth Prophet as a kind of tribute to to her professor so a number of American women altered the cultural map of Paris by establishing hubs of modernist activity that became city landmarks and example, what's very famous as Gertrude Stein's salon, um, somewhat less well known is her sister-in-law, Sarah Samuel Stein. They were both women who um, not only changed their own lives by going to Paris, but who really changed Paris itself and Western culture generally. Um, because of the positions of authority that they achieved within the Parisian avant-garde. And they did that by taking a chance on up and coming artists such as Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse, at a time when such abstract work was considered radically experimental and nearly incomprehensible and therefore quite affordable. It's not like they had so much money, um, but they were, uh, they were purchasing art that was not as expensive as old masters or even impressionists at that time. And both of these women held weekly salons at their respective homes where people would come to look at all the art on display. Remember, they couldn't have gone to a museum at this time to see Picasso or Matisse. You would have to go to a private collection and nobody else had collections like theirs. A lot of people would come from other countries. Anyone passing through Paris with an interest in art would want to see this crazy art that these women were collecting. And a lot of them, look, you know, honestly, they came to laugh, but they were convinced after meeting with these women, hearing uh, a little bit more about the art, meeting the artists themselves, and the artists met each other there, Picasso and Matisse met at Gertrude Stein's salon, for example. So one of Gertrude's uh, biographers described her as operating an entirely new form of institution, a ministry of propaganda for modern art. So really the impact that these two women and other unconventional American women in Paris had on the development of modern art really is profound. Now, Gertrude Stein defied convention in her personal life as well as in her artistic taste. She rejected traditional ideas about gender and sexuality by adopting a masculine persona and committing to a lifelong partnership with Alice B. Toklas, who's in a uh, watercolor on the left. And then in the drawing on the right by Francis Cyril Rose, you can see how Alice is engaged in the stereotypically feminine craft of needlework in the background, while Gertrude is in the stereotypically masculine role as a thinker and writer with um, seated at her desk, with a pen in one hand and her fingers um, sort of touching her temple to draw attention to her active mind. 
years earlier when Gertrude Stein posed for this portrait uh, by one of her young and still little known protégés, Pablo Picasso, she flaunted her disregard for gender-based proprieties. And you can see what she's doing in this portrait. Um, that is not a ladylike way to sit. Um, she's got her knees splayed. She's kind of unevenly resting her weight on one knee and uh, through imaging technology, it's been shown that Picasso actually made her seem even more askew by lowering the shoulder on the left and raising the one on the right. So she really seems to be just sort of tipping over. Um, and she's wearing this unusual costume that she must have been the only woman in Paris to wear. It's a shapeless brown corduroy robe. She wore it with sandals, um, again, getting rid of the tight corseting and tailor dresses that she wore when she first arrived in Paris in 1903 and that most women were still wearing at the time. Now, what's really remarkable about this painting is that this highly unconventional American woman forced Picasso uh, to take his art in a new direction. And scholars consider this portrait to have been really a turning point in his development of cubism. What happened was when he had been working on the painting for a very long time, just found himself incapable of satisfying himself with Gertrude Stein's face. He said, I've looked at you for so long, I no longer can see what you look like. So he took a break, he went to Spain, he looked at some uh, examples of Iberian sculpture, such as I'm showing you here. And then he came back with the idea of painting her face as a stylized mask. And what's important to remember is this is a full year before he painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon which is the painting, the famous painting with African masks on naturalistically rendered bodies. So it was really this painting of, of Gertrude Stein that launched that whole movement of, of his art. Now, the portrait became so famous and uh, so crucial to Gertrude Stein's self-promotion that she often, as you can see here, posed with the portrait, no matter where it was moving in her house, she somehow found a way to be beside it or under it uh, when she was photographed so that people would continue to associate, her, to associate her with Picasso as their power dynamic shifted. And she had once been the, the powerful one that, who he wanted to paint. Now he was the famous artist and he wanted, she wanted people to remember I made him, he may have painted me and made me in that sense, but I was really the one who made him. And she considered herself an equivalent genius because her innovative writing style, um, which made patterns out of words and crafted them into disjointed nonlinear narratives. She felt that she was doing with words what he was doing with his cubist paintings. And so just before her death, she bequeathed this portrait to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the only portrait or only painting work of art of any kind that she um, really made sure got into a prominent public collection. She did that so that future generations would continue to associate her with Picasso and to remember her legacy for, for modern art. Her sister-in-law, Sarah Stein, played an even more influential role in the career of Henri Matisse. In addition to being his principal collector and promoter, she was his close friend, confidant, advisor. Uh, she helped him work through many creative impasses he faced. She encouraged him to open an international art school in Paris that introduced students from around the world to fauvism. And just as Gertrude had done with Picasso, Sarah Stein pushed Matisse to develop his art in a new direction. Uh, the preparatory studies for this portrait show how he gradually worked beyond just a physical likeness of her, just what she looked like, in order to create a more abstract impression of how he felt about her, of the um, psychological and emotional qualities he associated with her. For example, this blue um, V shape that's emerging out of, of the base of the painting kind of rising up, it gives a sense that she is rising up and expanding out from the canvas. He originally painted that be a green color, but I think the blue um, has a more spiritual uh, kind of Pacific quality to it, which changes the way uh, the impression that the painting makes. And then the slight tilt of her head and her upward gaze and the highlight on her forehead, all these things kind of convey a sense of her thoughtfulness, uh, empathy, um, way he felt about her as his advisor and friend. Now, under the influence of Gertrude and Sarah Stein, 
several other women, American women in Paris, such as Catherine Dreyer on the left and Emily Bain Chadbourne on the right, um, also took a risk on collecting experimental artworks that more established collectors still were a little bit leery of. And as early adopters of modernism, all these women, uh, these unconventional American women in Paris were responsible for establishing major collections that are now enshrined in US museums. Now, another direction that American women in Paris pursued was literature, modern literature. Writers such as Kay Boyle on the left, and I hope you notice I'm mentioning a lot of California people, the Steins uh, from Oakland and Kay Boyle taught at Berkeley for many years. Um, and also Jesse Redmond Fawcett on the right. Uh, these were women who really pushed back against male biases in literature to probe topics such as gender and identity and sexuality from a candid female perspective. Uh, Jesse Redmond Fawcett in particular um, drew on the experiences of Black women in France and referenced those of other women she knew, such as um, her portraitist, Laura Wheeler Waring, and her, uh, the sculptor Augusta Savage, you may have heard of. Um, and Fawcett returned to France several times. She explained to someone who asked her why she spent so much time going to France that she, she said, I felt that my growth as a writer has been hampered in my own country. And so, but only temporarily, I have fled from it. So I think as with Lois Maylou Jones, it just was this kind of respite from all the, the um, racism and segregation and violence that uh, they were facing in the United States. At the center of literary modernism in Paris was this woman, Sylvia Beach, the daughter of a Princeton, New Jersey minister who yearned for an independent career. She had gone to France during World War I, like many of these American women, to help with the war effort and just decided to stay. Um, she borrowed a bit of money from her mother and established one of the most important hubs of literary modernism in Europe, Shakespeare and Company, which is an English language bookshop and lending library that became much more than that. It became an incubator for progressive literature. Um, from 1919, when she opened the shop until the German occupation of Paris in 1941, she was the go-to source in Paris for avant-garde poetry, banned books, experimental magazines. Um, she facilitated cross-cultural exchange and innovation through this network of American and British and European writers who came to Shakespeare and Company, met each other, uh, attended readings. She recommended books for people to read and all her the papers for Shakespeare and Company are now at Princeton University Library. And you can see from the cards she kept what books people bought or checked out. So what was Ernest Hemingway reading? What was Gertrude Stein reading? It's a wonderful resource. Um, in 1922, Beach became a legend in modernist circles by publishing James Joyce's controversial novel, Ulysses. And she did this without any prior experience in publishing. She did it at her own personal expense and in defiance of US and British censors. Um, she was the first American woman to take on Ulysses because back in the United States, a couple of years earlier, uh, Jane Heath and her partner, Margaret Anderson had begun serializing Ulysses in their uh, literary magazine and were prosecuted for distributing pornography. So after that, publishers were not wanting to touch the book, but Beach believed in its importance. And she really believed in Joyce. She thought she, he, was a, she, he was a great writer. And she went to the extreme um, uh, tactic of saying to him, when he said, I'd like to change a sentence, I'd like to add a paragraph, I'd like to delete that page and substitute this one. While the book was being typeset, uh, she gave him a go ahead to make all those changes. So the type was being set and then it was being taken out, it was being put back in, um, just because she really wanted the book to be what the author wanted it to be. And it bankrupted her, but it allowed a classic of British literature to emerge exactly as the author wanted. So without Sylvia Beach, Ulysses would not exist as it does today. No professional publisher would have done what she did. In Paris, Beach also found the freedom to lead a more authentic personal life. Like many of the women that I worked on this exhibition, I found that um, she not only wanted to have a, a different kind of career than she could have had in the United States, but she wanted to have a different kind of personal life. And she began a long-term relationship with Adrienne Manier, 
the woman you see on the left in the photograph, who um, had a French language bookshop that was a sister institution to Shakespeare and Company and located right across the street. And it was Monnier's brother-in-law, Paul Emile Becat, who painted the portrait of Beach on the right. And she's dressed in this customary uniform she wore, uh, kind of a masculine brown velvet blazer, the floppy bow tie. She has a signet ring, pocket watch. All these things are kind of masculine. Um, they're ways of asserting her identity as a businesswoman. And, but what's really remarkable to me is this really assertive pose she's adopting. She's turning in her chair um, to, to kind of fix us with this very appraising sharp look. Uh, this is very unusual in a woman's portrait of this period for a woman to be really confronting the viewer in this way, but it recurs in several of the portraits in Brilliant Exiles. as a way I think of re reinventing the traditions for representing women in portraiture. Now this characterization seems very bold until it is compared with a photograph of Beach by Berenice Abbott, another American woman in Paris, a photographer. Um, Abbott described Beach as turning up in her studio in this very photogenic coat, a glossy black rain slicker. And she chose to adopt the pose you see here, kind of like a daring adventurer, the hand on her hip and this intense over the shoulder gaze. Um, really a strong way of representing herself. Now, Berenice Abbott herself had set up for Paris in 1921 like many of these women, she had a one-way ticket and very little money. And she said, whatever happens, happens. Didn't have a job, didn't really know what she was gonna do, but just felt she had to make a change. So in Paris, uh, she became the darkroom assistant for the uh, expatriate American photographer, Man Ray. And then she became a serious rival after taking up photography herself in 1925. He made the mistake of saying, instead of giving you a raise, I'll let you use my, my um, camera equipment. And she became uh, a photographer to rival him as a portraitist very quickly. In this self-portrait here, you see um, this downward tilt of her head, which really makes her large pale eyes appear even more prominent, I think, to draw attention to her, her role as observer. And she prided herself on a kind of come as you are approach to portraiture. She told people to wear whatever they wanted, to adopt whatever pose they wanted, and she didn't um, direct or control them in any way. So it gave her subjects an agency, almost like a, they were doing a self-portrait, and she just clicked the camera. And she gravitate, gravitated toward other people who really pushed the boundaries as she did and were unconventional in some way. One of them was Janet Flanner, the woman you see here. Uh, she was a writer for 50 years, from 1925 to 1975, she wrote the letter from Paris column in the New Yorker. And her articles provided American readers with on the ground intelligence about the latest developments in Parisian art, literature, theater, politics, social life. Um, and as the magazine's only foreign correspondent, she had great power to influence American ideas about Paris. She was a very private person. Uh, she kept her personal life separate from her public image and wrote under the pen name Genet, which masked both her gender and her nationality. And she talked about how she enjoyed this sort of double perspective she had as, uh, as an American who also had insight into Parisian culture. And I wonder if the double masks that you see on her top hat maybe are an allusion to that kind of double vision that she had, um, but they're also a very surrealist touch. Um, just wanna mention two other American women in literary Paris who deserve mention, uh, Zelda Fitzgerald on the left, Therese Crosby on the right. Uh, in Paris, Zelda Fitzgerald sought an independence, and she was looking for an independent artistic identity separate from her famous husband, uh, Scott Fitzgerald. As you may know, he had a history of appropriating her writing and passing it off as his own. And when she found herself blocked as a writer, she returned to her youthful love of ballet and began a grueling course of training in Paris with the hope of um, appearing with the ballet roots in Paris. This is quite an ambitious, <laughs> ambitious uh, goal for someone who's already in her 20s, but she tried and practiced around the clock, seven days a week, just 
drove herself into the ground trying to prepare to perform with the ballet. In her novel, Save Me the Waltz, the only novel she wrote, uh, she shattered the graceful illusions of ballet that really were created by male specters. We think of spectators, um, you know, Edgar Degas, for example, where it's an audience member looking at these graceful ballet dancers. She wanted to do something different and write about and also paint what it felt like to be a dancer, um, how your muscles feel like they're bulging and about to burst from your skin, how your feet feel heavy and swollen. And that's what she's showing in this self-portrait of herself on the right with a male dancer on the left. And she's um, tossing aside these pastel colored tutus, eliminating these uh, sort of artificial feminine thrill frills um, that then draw attention to how similar the male and female bodies are. They're both powerful and muscular. Uh, and then Caress Crosby, this was a very fascinating woman to work on. She traded a privileged existence in the United States as a um, affluent wife and mother for a life of bohemian adventure in Paris. Um, she, even before she went to Paris, she invented the modern backless brassiere and patented it as a young debutante when she just said, I can't wear these corsets and dance. So she put together some handkerchiefs and designed this bra and then patented it and then created a factory to manufacture them, which she then sold to Warner's, which um, has been a manufacturer of ladies undergarments for some time. And then she threw it all aside to go to Paris in 1922 and reinvent herself as an artist and poet. And she went on to co-found uh, Edition Narcisse and the Black Sun Press. And these were two publishing houses that specialized in deluxe editions of modern literature and art. And then in 1930, she reversed course and began publishing low cost paperbacks of contemporary authors, which is way ahead of its time. And after leaving Paris in 1936, she did all kinds of other interesting things. Um, she established an internationally, international quarterly journal, two world peace organizations, an artist colony in Italy, and one of Washington DC's first galleries uh, featuring modern European and African-American art. So clearly a remarkable woman. And I don't think you really see much evidence of her intelligence and passion in this painting, uh, perhaps because her portraitist was a hostile witness. This was, Julia uh, Chentoff was a uh, Belarusian artist who was in the process of having an affair with Chris Crosby's husband when she painted this. So I think that's why she just appears as a kind of um, glamorous icon of 1920s femininity. Um, so I've mentioned earlier some of the African-American writers and artists who went to Paris. There were also women who found success in Paris as entertainers and entrepreneurs during the 1920s and 1930s. And one of the most celebrated was Ada Smith, who was universally known as Bricktop because of her red hair. Um, for 15 years until World War II forced her departure from France, Bricktop was the internationally renowned proprietor of some of Montmartre's most famous night spots. Um, her clubs provided a home base for African-Americans in Paris. They were a place where black and white guests could go freely in a way that was not possible in the segregated United States. And she had tremendous success uh, opening a succession of clubs under her own name. Uh, and fortunately, she opened the most ambitious of them all in 1931, right after the stock market crash in the United States when money was getting tight everywhere. And uh, it was just kind of a disaster. And this photograph by her friend, Carl Van Becten, who was visiting Paris in 1934 and took a series of paint uh, photographs of Bricktop at her former haunts, um, I think almost as a kind of swan song to her Paris career. And I think that explains her, her expression here. It's kind of a, a bit of a sardonic smirk, not really a robust smile. Um, and she's shown with a bottle of champagne being advertised in the background, uh, very appropriate for her career. Um, she took under her wing other African-Americans coming through Paris, especially women. Uh, one of her um, protégés was the singer and dancer Josephine Baker, arguably, I would say, the most famous American 
living in Paris at this time. But she had sailed to France as a 19 year old in 1925, hardly known at all, chorus girl performing in all black reviews. And literally overnight, she rocketed to fame. Um, she performed these theatrical roles that were based on French colonial fantasies of Africa. Um, and this photograph by the uh, celebrity photographer Valéry shows this kind of paradoxical combination of racial and national stereotypes that Baker was expected to embody. So you can see she's performing the latest American dance sensation, the Charleston, doing the bee's knees, uh, crisscrossing her arms and her legs. Um, and she's before this very modern backdrop, backdrop with ocean liners and skyscrapers and Klieg lights. And yet, entirely illogically, her costume is this pseudo-African grass skirt with feathers worn on her ankles and wrists. So she was expected to be both modern as an American and then somehow what the, um, at the time was regarded as primitive as someone who had some kind of connection to Africa. Oh, she was from St. Louis, uh, but it was just this kind of fantasy. But she really pushed back against those stereotype roles that she performed on stage and in posters and photographs, such as you see here, um, she clowned around, she, uh, well, these posters kind of objectified her and sexualized her and um, kind of dwelled on this um, kind of colonial African primitivist fantasy. But then on stage, the way she performed these roles was by clowning around, rolling her eyes, she'd knock her knees together and just generally make clear that these were silly fantasies that were not reality. And then to undercut them even further, off stage, she made a point of dressing in couture clothing and modeling for high fashion magazines. And she said, I was expected to personify the savage on the stage. So I tried to be as civilized as possible in daily life. And you can see what a strong contrast there is here. All the designers wanted to dress her and she very willingly went along and wore all these glamorous clothes um, when she was off the stage. Other American women in Paris gravitated to the social circle of the writer, Natalie Clifford Barney. And she's another American woman who established an important Parisian cultural landmark. Uh, from 1909 until 1969, 60 years, she convened uh, weekly gatherings of writers, artists, and thinkers from around the world as a spur to innovation in literature and the arts. Uh, Barney was fully bilingual and she composed most of her poetry and epigrams and essays in French. She lived and wrote also as a lesbian and especially promoted the work of women who shared her queer and feminist perspective. She was really committed to facilitating connections among creative women of different nationalities who otherwise would not have known of each other's work. And she, um, in 1927, she founded what she called uh, the Académie des Femmes, a women's academy as a foil to the all male Académie Française. Now, I, this is a painting of Aunt Natalie Barney by her mother, Alice Pike Barney. She was uh, another American woman who spent a lot of time in Paris. And this painting, I think really conveys a little bit about um, how magnetically attractive she was. She was known for having this beautiful golden hair, these melting blue eyes. Here she's seated in a kind of throne-like chair with a violin in her hand, as if ready to beguile us with sweet music, wearing this luxurious red velvet gown, very low cut. Um, everything about it kind of conveys this very sensual impression, though a painting by her mother. Um, and then there were other women in her circle, um, such as Erde la Nook, drawing of Natalie Barney's on the left, and Romaine Brooks, whose self-portraits on the right. Um, these were women in her circle who were interested in finding new ways of visualizing the unconventional women that were in Barney's circle um, in fact, and trying to invent new modes of female portraiture. So um, the portrait, the self-portrait of Romaine Brooks in particular has become a, a real, really iconic uh, painting. One of the paintings in the exhibition that people are really gravitating toward. And it uh, has a kind of interesting backstory. Romaine Brooks had, um, been raised in a very affluent family, but her parents were 
extremely abusive. And she decided at one point that she'd rather be disinherited um, and just try to make her way as an artist and live for many years in dire poverty trying to do that. And then unexpectedly in 1902, she found out she hadn't been disinherited. Actually, she had inherited a huge fortune. And so now she had all the money in the world to do whatever she wanted with. Um, she no longer was struggling to survive. And so she began to rebuild her damaged sense of self and try to figure out, well, who am I then? And there are other paintings and photographs in which you can see her trying on different ident identities, different ways of presenting herself and thinking of herself. And so this painting from 1923, she'd reached a stage uh, in which she was kind of portraying herself as a, a sort of 19th century Victorian dandy, um, wearing this kind of stereotypical uh, uh, black top hat and a kind of shapeless jacket with her thumb tucked into her jacket. It's a very jaunty kind of masculine bravura touch. Uh, these are all kind of male coded signifiers. And yet she's wearing bright red lipstick. And I don't know if you can make out, but she's also got the red, um, that's the Legion of Honor medal that she's got in her lapel. And so those two accents of red really pop on this monochromatic painting. Um, but at the same time that uh, she's being kind of bravura in her self-presentation, she's being very protective. Uh, she's very buttoned up. Uh, the hat brim is really um, shadowing her eyes. We can't really gain purchase on her gaze. She seems to be looking at us, but we can't really see the expression of her eyes. And then in the background, there is this very mysterious like shell of a burned out city. And art historians have wondered what this signifies. Why is that in the background of her self-portrait? I think of it as maybe representing this horrible past that she's left behind. It's all dead and gone and over. And she is a survivor. She's a very self-contained and careful and protective, but she's still surviving like a phoenix rising out of the ashes, sort of. So um, along with Brooks, many other women in Paris, American women, develop new ways of presenting themselves, kind of reinventing themselves through fashion or decor, or these external expressions of identity. And one of the most interesting is Therese Bonney, uh, another California girl. She went to Berkeley and then she went on to get a doctoral degree at the Sorbonne. Um, and this was quite remarkable at the time. American women didn't get doctoral degrees at the Sorbonne. And newspapers across the country were running articles about her, showing her in her cap and gowns, reports on this brilliant American woman who's got this degree. And this kind of gave her the idea that um, public relations, self-promotion might be an intriguing career path. So she settled in Paris. And from 1923 to 1939, she operated one of the first transatlantic photographic syndicates in existence. That, and hers really helped to shape the canon of modernist design. She would go to artist studios, fashion houses, designer studios, and select the artists, the designers, the work that she felt was worthwhile, modernist design. And she would take photographs, she would write uh, captions interpreting what these objects were all about. And then she would distribute the illustrations and the captions to newspapers and magazines across the United States and uh, Europe um, as a kind of curator of modernism for a world market. So she was really, she had a great deal of power to select and interpret what was going to be seen as modern Parisian design. She said she did this because she wanted to spur innovation in the United States. Uh, she said, we should be creating furniture and homes which can stand proudly beside our skyscrapers, our factories, our art airplanes, our automobiles, all these things that were very modern in the United States. But she felt that in terms of art and design, uh, America was really lagging behind uh, Paris. So in order to have the clout to promote these artists and designers, she had to establish her own uh, identity as a kind of insider with access to the avant-garde. So she had a number of avant-garde artists who were also friends and this kind of quid pro quo almost. Uh, she would promote them and they would paint her portrait and she would take photo have photographs made of her posing for the portraits and of the portraits themselves and distribute these to newspapers. So it was a really a kind of uh, log rolling kind of operation, but one that 
gave prominence to many, many important uh, designers and artists. And this is a portrait of her by one of those artists. He's a um, tapestry designer, Jean Lossat. And he's painted her in this very unusual way in this diagonally slanted, very off kilter pose, this kind of leaning on a window sill, I believe, window ledge, looking out on a surrealist seascape uh, with these red and blue and yellow shadows, I guess, on her on her dress with this uh, left arm or this her proper right arm, as if it's in motion, it's very unusual work. And if you could see it in person, it's painted in very vibrant, rough brushwork. So you get this real sense of energy and dynamism from it. But her head is so thoughtful. Um, she's looking down in kind of abstracted gaze. So Lursat seems to be saying, you know, this woman is a real mover and shaker, but and she's guided by an intelligent mind. And so then finally, um, for the last work I want to talk about, we come to Peggy Guggenheim. And, and she was another woman who rebelled against her traditional upbringing uh, by joining the Parisian avant-garde. At 21, she inherited a fortune that made her wealthy, wealthy enough to live as she pleased, even if she was not very rich by Guggenheim standards. She always had a bit of a chip on her shoulder about being the poor cousin to the great Guggenheims. Um, but she moved in Paris um, and became a well-known figure in avant-garde artistic and literary circles. She used her resources to support many struggling artists and writers in Paris. For example, Berenice Abbott, the photographer I mentioned earlier, uh, her first two cameras were purchased for her by Peggy Guggenheim and several other artists in brilliant exiles owed uh, their support to her. She also helped European artists and one of them was Alfred Cormes, the artist who made this painting. And he made the portrait as an expression of his gratitude for her help. And it really highlights Guggenheim's up to the minute style. She's got this short slick back hair, uh, chandelier earrings, cutting edge geometrically patterned blouse, which is probably designed by the avant garde painter and designer Sonia Delone. And then in the background is a red motor car, um, which adds this connotation of modern speed and mobility and technology. So when World War II broke out in September 1939, Guggenheim began buying avant-garde paintings and sculptures that were threatened by the Nazi assault on degenerate art. Um, she also helped endangered artists themselves escape to safety. And despite the risk she faced as a Jewish woman, a Jewish American woman, she remained in Paris until July, 1941, which is quite late. And then the following year in New York, she opened an art gallery, the Art of the Century. Uh, it was a launching pad for abstract expressionism, and uh, it really helped New York replace Paris as the center of modern art. So that she's kind of a pivotal figure, taking us from the beginning where it's Paris that everyone's going to to be to be engaged in modern art to New York as the new center of modernism. And this particular portrait is on loan to the Portrait Gallery from the Franco-American Museum in Blairancourt, France. And that's the former home of Anne Morgan, who was one of the uh, many American women who volunteered to help uh, with the French war effort during World War I. And the, her home was donated to, she donated her home to the French state and is now this museum about the French American relationship. So in several different respects, this painting really speaks to the reciprocal impact of American women on Paris and of Paris on American women uh, and it makes an appropriate place <laughs> to end this talk. So I just want to conclude by saying that my hope for Brilliant Exiles is that the exhibition and book will draw attention to this remarkable group of American women, obviously, but also to prompt reflection on a few important questions. Um, number one being how differently would things have turned out for these brilliant exiles, and for all of us, for our culture, had there not been a Paris in which they could develop their talents and lead authentic lives? And then also, how much has changed over the past century? Uh, to what extent do the freedoms and possibilities these women sought remain works in progress even today? I think there are a lot of parallels between the, the situations that they faced and things that we still talk about now. So I'll just point out that there's uh, on our website, uh, which you see that you're all here, there's a great deal of information about these women, um, the 
All the porch, all the paintings, the portraits of all kinds are online there. There are text and audio labels, a podcast, and many other features. So if you want to learn more, that would be a good place to start.